Hello, welcome to a special program. We are here at the, the Abington Fire Headquarters, and I'm joined by Abington Fire Chief uh, John Nunnell, as well as a firefighter, firefighter paramedic, would that be correct? Uh, Derek Hamadi. Did I say that correctly? You did. Okay. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit about the needs of the Abington Fire Department, starting with uh, an ongoing effort to do a feasibility study. Um, Chief, I'll let you start off with talking a little bit about what's going on with the feasibility study and the need to, to conduct such um, an effort. Sure. Again, welcome everybody. You're actually uh, joined in my office. We're, we're filming this in the fire department, in the fire chief's office, uh, to try to bring some of the issues and concerns of the both fire stations to you because, as always, any resident is always welcome to visit the fire stations, although it's not always easy to do that for a number of reasons. Um, Route 18 is difficult to get to at the headquarters station, the parking is an issue, and just everybody's schedules, we understand that. So we're going to try to tape this program or perhaps a few programs to bring the fire stations to you and to explain the, the concerns that we have with the actual facilities at both fire station one and fire station two, which really prompted the, the feasibility study that uh, the residents voted some funding for last year at town meeting. So the feasibility study is a, an independent study by a number of experts in, in various fields um, to see where we as a town, and specifically the Abington Fire Department, stands currently with the, the physical plants that we have, both stations, are the locations correct, they're going to do a traffic study on that. Um, mechanically within the fire stations, we, we've had heating, ventilation, plumbing, um, HVAC, looking to see where we stand. The, the, we're starting to get some of these reports in, and, and there's really no surprise, we're not really doing great with these reports. These are old buildings. Um, headquarters station was built in 1964, and it has been staffed um, nonstop, 24 hours a day since 1964. This is probably one of the most used, used public buildings in town, municipal buildings. And this was built prior to when the town had an ambulance. We didn't have a lot of the equipment that we had then. We certainly didn't have a lot of the, the streets and the infrastructure that Abington has now, the Abington of 1964, which predates me. That is not the Abington of today, just natural growth. And as, as we've all seen the growth in this town, um, really has, has began to overtake um, our capabilities of, of, of what we're able to do. Station 2 at number 5 Rockland Street was built in 1973. And that building was really designed for more of a southern climate. I think it was a Florida type building. And we've had issues with that since day one, specifically with the, the heating and uh, the ventilation of that building. We, we've had some issues. And we'll, we'll show you some photographs of that. That building is also very small. There's, there's not a lot of room. Uh, to store the equipment. We've made do and we continue to make do with both stations. We, we keep them um, up to date and, and well maintained as best that we can within, within the confines of the structure. However, we're, we're really beginning to see the limitations. Um, so the feasibility study is, is going to look at all of that. We're looking at any hazardous conditions. You know, we, we, we had an asbestos study done at, at both of these buildings. We found a few things that we did not know. We've already taken care of some of those. Some of the asbestos is really inherent within the structure of the building. It's in some of the concrete and some of the, the caulking around the windows and you know, under some of the, the floor um, tiles that are held down. Most of it's, it's hidden at that point, but there was a few that we didn't realize we had, and we've already begun to mitigate that. Um, structurally, both stations, we had a, a structural expert look at them. I think structurally they're sound. We, we simply outgrown them. Um, so the feasibility study is looking at all of these things, as well as it should provide the town um, a recommendation whether we can rehab the existing buildings, add on for the existing buildings, or maybe just try to build a brand new facility in town. And the, the town fire station building committee is, is going to be tasked, I think, with taking a lot of that information and make a recommendation to the town to see where we as a town are going to want to proceed. What's your role in this, in this whole process of the feasibility study? I believe that there is a working group. Would you be a member on that working group? So I'm, I'm the chairman of the uh, Abington Internal Fire Committee. Um, 
I work with other firefighters that are in the department as well as the chief, and we are trying to take a voice of everything that we have and, and want to bring up and bring it to the town committee. I was recently appointed to the town's fire station committee. Um, we have our first meeting coming up, so right now it's not fully put together. Uh, but my role is going to be to take the information from the fire department and all the members here and bring that to the town committee. That way we can share that information and make sure we have a, a good voice that's going to be there on the committee. Chief, how important is it to, to have uh, members of this fire station, the two fire stations, being a vital part of the conversation about building a new fire station? I think it's critical because they're the employees, uh, both the firefighter paramedics, as well as our administrative assistant. You know, she's an employee here mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, the deputy fire chief, all of us that are here, myself, all of the employees that, are, that really work within these buildings, and they understand really how a fire station works. A fire station is a very unique building, especially when you have a fire station that's providing emergency medical care. Uh, most of the members are paramedics, so we have some um, incredibly sophisticated equipment that we store within the buildings for that ambulance. We have medications. They have to be kept in a safe. They should be kept in a safe. Uh, there's a lot of decontamination of not only the ambulance, you know, biohazard materials uh, in our equipment we have to clean. Even after a fire, our fire gear, our fire equipment, the, the products of combustion, the, the, the soot, the ashes, the smoke, we're really beginning to realize in, in the fire service a lot of that is very carcinogenic. And when we return to the fire station, they really should be in a dedicated area uh, ventilated to the outside to prevent those off-gassing of our physical fire gear. It actually off-gasses that studies have shown. Um, and that goes in a, should go in a specific room to, to vent to the outside. Right now, we don't have it. They literally go on a hook on the wall, which is directly adjacent to all of the living quarters within the stations, at both stations. There's a lot of work that needs to be done at these stations. And it's not, that's not a quick fix. That's more of an inherent design feature within a, within a modern fire station that would incorporate that. It's not something you can easily add, a, a, a ventilated room within the confines of a, of a tight building to begin with. This feasibility study will address certain things like uh, space limitation. And I want to get come at it from two different angles, from the administrative side mm -hmm to the everyday working, whether you're working and living here. We'll start with, with you, Derek, as far as the working and the living, and whether it's backing a vehicle in, whether it's a matter of storing gear, what's it like for you and your, your colleagues? Well, right now the apparatus bay is, is pretty tight compared to uh, modern fire stations. Uh, a long time ago, the, the station was designed to fit smaller pieces. So when we move around in the station, everything is really tight. It's hard for us to get from one side of the station to the other because of the size limitations that the vehicles have put uh, into, the, into the station itself. Um, everything is very tight and cluttered. There's not a lot of storage space. So we have started using every little inch that we have to store what we have. So there's not a lot of uh, working room for us to move around the station. And that also goes with if you're here and, and there's no call. So whether it's a common area where you all congregate or where you are staying during your 24, 48-hour shift, or you want to do some, some physical therapy, you know, you want to do some, some exercise. It's, it's kind of tight quarters, correct? Yep, everything's kind of uh, combined. Our day-to-day -day living spot that's downstairs, our day room and our watch room, mm -hmm. uh, as the chief said, is adjacent to all the apparatus floor um, pieces. Uh, as far as our uh, rest of our living space, that incorporates everything else that we have. That's our personal storage areas, that's our gym equipment that we have, it's all right next to each other. So every little piece that we have, we try to fit into what, what rooms we have. And, and that's just, it, that's both stations, is that correct? Correct. So from the administrative side, and, and when you look at it, and we're talking about trying to back a vehicle in or, or their living space, but let's look at the postage stamp that you're located on and looking the growth of Route 18. What is it like trying to pull a vehicle out especially in an emergency, if you've got a motor vehicle accident up the street or in a, a medical emergency, what's that like? Administratively, I, I, I could spend an hour talking about this, but you're absolutely correct. I'll, I'll begin with the traffic, and this is both stations. Station 2 on the corner of uh, Brockton Avenue and Rockland Street, we, we also have issues trying to both respond from that station, cutting through traffic, as well as returning back into the station. I'm going to start at Station 2 because we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, most residents in Abington know where, where some of the 
the congested areas in this town is. One of them is directly in front of this fire station. Anybody that's commuting home uh, from Route 3 or from you know, Weymouth along Route 18, this is a parking lot from about 3 o'clock in the afternoon until it alleviates about 6 o'clock in the afternoon daily. And we are right there. We, we've the, the other location, uh, there's a couple locations in town, but is on Brockton Ave right near Station 2. That traffic also tends to back up the intersection of Route 123 and 18, and that goes up both 123 towards Brockton or towards Groveland Street in Brockton. And our fire station is very close in proximity to that corner. So when either the ambulance or an engine from Station 2, depending on the call, responds out, we're cutting through that traffic. And we, we generally don't have an issue getting out because we have all the lights and sirens on. And most drivers, for the most part, really do see that and, and they try to pull over. However, when we go to back in, when we're returning to the stations, um, we're coming back silently, as you will. You know, we don't have the lights going on all the time, with the exception of when we go to back the apparatus in. And I have witnessed myself, um, our ambulance trying to back in, and we do have the lights, not the siren, but the lights on as a warning, because there's no traffic light there, um, to, to try to pull out and then back into the bay. And about that time, usually we're getting cars that are flying up, and that's the correct word, from Route 123 going up onto Rockland Street. And several times that ambulance has had some near misses. The engine is a little larger. They, they tend to, I think they see the engine more, but the ambulance, and the ambulance is large as well. It's closer more towards that intersection. And we've had a few near misses where we're trying to back in and cars are just flying right past us. And there's been some very tight, tight misses. Here at headquarters on Route 18, even responding out of here is an issue. We've tried to, um, we've, line, we've had the state line the street in front of the station with some uh, X's, hatch marks along the pavement to try not to park there. That, that paint is already gone, to be honest with you. It's worn away after six months. And nobody really heated that anyway. We have signs out front, do not block the fire station, do not block the driveway. One of those signs just got hit. It's, 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 the traffic out here is, is a nightmare. And this is why we're still in two lanes. And, and granted, during the construction, it's difficult. However, when the construction is finally completed, we're going to have four lanes out here, which is going to make it, I think, even more difficult, um, both responding out of here, but even returning. And the other aspect of returning is this fire department, because we're relatively small, we rely uh, fairly extensively on off-duty help when we have either a fire or numerous calls going on at the same time, mul multiple emergencies at the same time, we try to backfill the fire station with off-duty firefighters to man another piece of equipment when all of our equipment is tied up. We're having difficulty getting the off-duty firefighters back into the station, either station, because of the traffic. Uh, it's just, you know, that's a delay. And we're, we're managing through it, but th this location is tough. And even if we, we try to put an addition onto this building at the headquarters station, um, we're still in the same location. Th this location is difficult to, to operate a, a, a modern fire station from. Ideally, what I'd like to do is a little bit of a compare and contrast. Knowing the fire service utilized something called mutual aid, and I'm sure yourself, where you've met with other chiefs, yep. or maybe, uh, you know, your, you, maybe your crew or your group has had to do station coverage and seen other fire stations mm -hmm. and seen more modern firehouses. Um, what, what has that been like for you, Derek, to, to go and do station coverage and go, wow, you guys got a really nice firehouse here and how it's designed. What's that like? We have seen new fire stations that are out there and it is night and day compared to what, what we work out of. Um, much larger apparatus bays, uh, easier to move around. All their apparatus fit inside. Um, they don't have to utilize any outside storage. Uh, it makes it easier for us to work it. They have more modern dispatch areas. Uh, watch rooms and the places that we go so when we go to cover a mutual aid town we we essentially take over and cover for them we have to be able to utilize what they have and their stuff is just better newer more up-to-date would there be any any stations off the top of your head you can think of where you're like on wow if you know if we could eventually have uh, something that, uh, a similar fire station or something that's in the, the same vein we have uh, visited a few stations just to see what some of the new modern day stations look like uh, and I know the chief came with us on a lot of these trips. Uh, Carver was uh, one of the stations we visited. It's not too far from here. Beautiful station, very modern, all up to date. Everything they had fit inside. Um, 
we saw Plainville, we saw Foxborough, um, Hyannis. We traveled around to see some of the newer stations that are getting built around uh, the state of Massachusetts and the way the fire service is going, and it is night and day compared to what we, we are working out of. And to, to back up what Derek said, I, I agree 100% with that. As part of the feasibility study, we are seeing, you know, specifically going to tour newer fire stations looking for ideas. I've been to a number of stations just, you know, from the profession that happens, but we don't always necessarily tour the entire station. So, the, so these station visits were specifically for that. And we've had most of the, the internal fire department uh, committee that, that went with that as tours. And what we're seeing with that, and it's really eye-opening because number one is, is a safety aspect. There's probably a minimum of five to eight feet around each piece of fire apparatus or ambulance on all these apparatus floors, the garage, if you will, uh, which enables you that when the ambulance, for example, is located within the fire station when it's parked in its spot, you can actually remove the stretcher. There's room behind the ambulance. You can remove the stretcher for cleaning, for inspection, for, for whatever. Uh, behind both of our ambulances right now is literally six inches. So we have to pull our ambulance outside to do that. Now, if it's a nice day in May or June, that's no problem. However, when we're looking at February, uh, January, February, March, in the winter months, and we have to decontaminate the stretcher, we're doing this outside in those conditions. It's a problem. That, that's number one. Number two is, um, especially the headquarters station here in Abington, we don't have any floor drains in our apparatus bay. That's, that's a safety issue. In fact, that's going to be a legitimate safety issue under the new OSHA rules that the state is now a part of. You're not supposed to have any standing water. That needs to be addressed, and that's not an easy fix. There are physically no floor drains in this station than ever was. So we have standing water, which that can be a, a slip and fall hazard. That water, as much as we do try to mitigate it out, but a lot of times the snow collects under the apparatus as you're driving, uh, you know, during the real during the snowstorms, and it just starts to drop as, as the station's here, and we do the best we can with squeegees. We, we push it out. However, sometimes that water migrates all the way into these offices, the administrative offices. This, this carpet has been soaked numerous times. The drywall gets wet, and we've replaced that before the, the bottom portions of it. It you know all of our fire trucks they're giant tanks of water. A, a fire engine typically carries 750 gallons of water for firefighting. And the trucks are rolled, and a truck is a truck, so it's not uncommon to have a leak, any type of a plumbing leak in some of these trucks. So even if it's not weather related, some trucks just simply leak, and that, that's inherent with the truck. They, they shouldn't, but they do. You know, we're running some older fire apparatus still. So again, there's, there's really nowhere for this water to go on its own. We, we do the best we can with it, but sometimes we, we actually just had a, a major leak. Just a seal goes on one of the, the many valves on a truck, and We've lost hundreds of gallons of water fairly immediately. That water's going here. So there's no way for that water to drain. Station 2 does have one floor drain. It has a common floor drain. The issues aren't as bad. However, there's just roof leaks there. So the, the, the roof is leaking in certain locations, even not in the apparatus floor. That's a structural issue. Water's an issue at both stations. Uh, administratively, looking at some of these other fire stations as well, um, our administrative offices are all over the place in this building. The, the building kind of has organically grown as, as we've been able to do it. Uh, the fire chief and the administrative assistance office are back in, in the back corner. We're actually uh, on the apparatus floor itself. We, we've eked out a, in, in the area that we, we built uh, offices years ago. The front office is one fairly common office. It looks like Barney Miller's office. And I say it jokingly, but it's very accurate. Anybody who's seen the old TV show Barney sure. Miller or yeah. any of these TV shows from the 1970s, that's what we're operating in. And while that may have some charm for some people, the reality is when we have the shift officer trying to do his business or her business, and we have the deputy fire chief who's also in charge of fire prevention, their desks are adjacent to each other. The general public comes in. If somebody has a, a permit question or a building construction question, somebody might be on a telephone and there's a conversation going on in the same room. Right adjacent to that is the main dispatch area. Even though we're dispatched out of Holbrook, we still have our own dispatch within the department. We, we still maintain some administrative dispatch, whether it's fire alarm, maintenance going on, or just, you know, we're talking to our own vehicles, whatever. It's noisy. It's loud. So it's really not conducive to, to doing any type of business. A lot of the, the buildings that we have seen, the, the, the fairly modern stations, they're all in the same area, but they're separated. 
So if you do need privacy, whether it's for a meeting with someone or for just a simple telephone call or to meet with a, uh, a contractor or a builder or an architect, there's areas you can do that without bothering anybody or being bothered by just the, the inherent nature of, of, of us trying to conduct business. And there's really no room in this station out to subdivide that. If, if, if you, when you start to see the photographs or the, the rooms that we have, you're going to understand it's a small space. These aren't simple fixes for it. So we're looking for, we're trying to choose, I think, the best ideas that different departments had. One fire station or one town may have a feature of their station we really liked. Uh, another one may have a great idea for an apparatus bay. One may have a great idea for administrative office or for a, 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 an exercise room, a dedicated weight room, or the bunking areas, the restrooms. We'll be talking about restrooms. We have major issues. Just with privacy, really lack of privacy. There is none. Uh, we have male and female employees. We have one common restroom at both stations. Upstairs is one common, a larger restroom shower and you're supposed to shower after fires, again, because of the, the carcinogens that are, that are really being studied. So we really need individual rooms for this. We, we, we really need to, to bring us up to the modern era. Uh, we're severely lacking in that area. And there's really no physical room in this building to, to just add a new, a new restroom or new facilities. How about as far as the, uh, the antiquated, you've got the mechanical and the utility issues in both buildings. Could you, could you both talk a little bit about that? Ironically this morning, and again, we're filming in my office, and I think this is the first time we've done this, and I'm, I'm impressed with the equipment that you have. Um, you were desperately looking for electrical outlets all over the place, and so as not to overload them, mm. as you saw this morning. Sure. And we found a few, and I think you plugged into about four separate outlets at this point. We are. Um, and the lights did a moment ago. So that's an example, <laughs> just, just from this morning that you saw. As part of the feasibility study, they did address all of those mechanical issues, the plumbing, the heating, uh, the electrical, and, and, and we're lacking in, in a number of areas. Uh, you know, I, I have been privy to some of those reports. They're not public yet, but there, there's work to be done. It's, again, the building was built in 1964, this building, headquarters, and we did not have nearly half of the equipment that we have now. We have more modern air compressors to, not a, there's a utility air compressor just to, to run mechanical issues around the station. But we also have a, an air bottle, a breathing bottle air compressor. We have ventilation systems for specifically for the exhaust, um, to, to, which is a large fan ultimately that, that connects to each piece of apparatus to, to try to remove the diesel fumes from it. We have electrical components that were not even dreamed of back in 1964, whether it be um, sort of like the computer components, a lot of the radio components, um, Lighting issues we have, more modern radios. The building was simply not designed for that. And, and we're really maxed out down to the amp, literally, in this building. We've had a lot of electrical work done, um, and we're maxed out, really, with, with, with the entire feed coming in. Uh, we do have a new generator at both stations, uh, because the, genera the emergency generators that we have were antiquated. They were put in just over a year ago. And the good thing with that is those be repurposed. When, when we added those generators to each station, they're kind of self-contained. If for whatever reason the town decided to go in a different direction away from these buildings, they could be repurposed to another town building in, uh, that, that the town owns if the, the town so chose to do that. They're not tied here forever. So we're very cognizant of what goes into maintaining these buildings. We, we have to live here. We, we, we still have to work here and, and make it work. However, we're trying to be careful not to tie anything in that's very expensive that may be here for a long time if we're not here for a long time. That's a balance I think we've been very um, successful at doing that with. Um, the heating plant here, the, the, the furnace, I think was put in about 1989. Um, however, it's the same piping. We, we have three main zones, heating zones, forced hot water for this whole building. It's incredibly inefficient. There is no air conditioning in this building. We, we use window air conditioners or just the windows open to, to do the best we can. And what, what occurs is, especially in the winter months, because we can't zone out individual rooms or areas, the heat is just on, and there's some areas that get warm so the window is open. It's, it's antiquated. Station 2 is, is chronic issues with that same, same issue. The plumbing, the plumbing is an issue. We, Besides not having floor drains, 
we, we also that means we can't wash the vehicles inside inside the building. That can lead to body rot. That has led to body rot in the apparatus. The apparatus is incredibly expensive, and we want to maintain it. So in the winter months here at the station, we can only wash them outside if it's in the winter in New England. If it's 10 to 15 degrees out, that's an issue. So to compensate that, we'll make a daily trip to station two. We move all the apparatus around. We'll, we'll bring the apparatus from up here as needed in there to try to wash it. Anybody that drives in New England knows once you leave the car wash, by the time you get home or to your destination, it's already dirty again. So that leads to the salt buildup. And we, it, it leads into to poor maintenance of the vehicles just because we, not having floor drains is an issue. If we try to wash them in front of the station, it ices up. We've tried that and that traditionally fails. I think we've covered a lot of ground. I think you've kind of touched on a lot of different areas. As someone who, who lives here uh, on a regular basis, is there anything we haven't touched upon but you feel is really important to tell the viewers about from whether it's in your own words or even conversations that you've had with other firefighters uh, in the building from time to time where you're like, oh, this is an issue, this is an issue? Uh, it's just the biggest thing that we've noticed is that we're, we've been here for so long we've noticed from the, the comparing to newer stations the living parts of the station are separated completely from the working areas of the station the new modern fire stations are completely designed to to separate hot zones versus cold zones and what that means is a hot zone is where the apparatus is where our fire gear is kept as the chief mentioned earlier discussing the our gear off gases from what we collect in the gym, and all of that is is separated and there's a big proponent of building new fire stations that design it so that way everyone stays safe. People in this profession typically get very sick uh, later in life because of the carcinogens that we're around all the time. Our station, the station that we're in right now, headquarters, everything is right next to each other. There is no divide from where we sit all day long uh, waiting to respond to a call to where our pieces are kept, where our gear is kept. So there's no ventilation, there's no hot cold zone, there's no divide. Uh, if you want to get from the front part of the building to the back part of the building, there's no way to get through the building without going past some of these hot zone items that newer fire stations designed. And it was really eye-opening seeing that. So a lot of the members of the committee that actually got to tour some of these other stations brought that back and said, wow, we really do live in quite a dangerous situation because we're always around these uh, toxic fumes and uh, off-gassing gear. It's also worth noting as well as this is your day room, uh, it's not only where, where you're waiting for a call and you, you're, you're there, it's where you have your meals, but you also, I think, don't you conduct your training in that area too? It's the same room. And, yeah. yep, we do all our training in our day room. We do our cooking in our day room. It's a small room. It's very small. The mm -hmm. chief mentioned that when people come to do, uh, when there's meetings that are held here, that's the largest room that we have. So typically that room gets taken over for whatever meeting needs to be done. If they want to do building design or construction questions or anything like that, that they just that people come in or have administrative meetings inside that room. That displaces us from the one room we have, which is really our kitchen. Since we are here for 24 hours, we do have to eat three times a day. And sometimes if there's business being conducted, that displaces us for times. Obviously, we do the best we can to work around our timing, but there should be separated areas so that way we don't have to be in that situation. If I could, if I could just add on Please what do. Derek said as well, you're 100% correct. One of the issues or, or the one of the casualties of this building, and that's, that's probably the correct word, and it's just really the building design and now with the location and, and the issues on Route 18 with the construction, is there's really a disconnect from this fire department with our residents. And administratively, I'm really seeing that. And this is not really a friendly building to visit. And it's not the, it's not the firefighters, it's the physical building. It's difficult to get to, and eventually that, that'll hopefully be fixed with the, once the construction is completed. But the parking's limited. Um, when, you, when you come to the headquarters station to conduct business, there's really one common area in the front, which, which is right near that main office in that dispatch area I talked about. So it's a busy area. And you know we've seen it before. People come in, and, and they feel like they're intruding because there's a lot of activity going on there. There's really no training room. And right now, we're, we're somewhat homeless when it comes to training. We've been doing. Our paramedic refresher training, some firefighter training. You know, sometimes we, we like to host more trainings with area towns, uh, so we're all on the same page. We all want to make sure we train together because if, if every department's doing their own doing their own individual training, but we're all at a large incident together, we, we want to make sure we get on the same page. Yeah. 
you know, th there's reasons we want to do common trainings. We simply don't have the room in this station. So we've, we've tried using the police station, their training room, which works. However, we also have large fire apparatus. And it's large, heavy fire apparatus that tends to, you know, we, we don't want to damage anybody else's um, parking areas. And, and there's a lot of, um, our apparatus takes up a lot of space. We've tried and we have used the, the Carter Room up at Town Hall for training. We recently, back in November, did some paramedic professor training there, which worked. However, we're also, you know, the, the paramedics, you know, they're trying to discuss whatever they're training. We're trying to keep the door shut because some of that maybe the public doesn't want to hear, depending mm -hmm. on what, what the nature of the sure. emergency medical situation is that they're training. But, and, and really, the, the students want to talk um, uninhibited. When we're in a, a shared space like that, that, that becomes an issue, to be honest with you. you know, some, sometimes you want to be able to have your own training without you know, impeding on anybody else doing business there. And there was no issue, but it's, it's there. So hopefully, you know, if, if we do get a, a new station, if, if we do decide as a town we to move forward, we definitely need a training room slash community room uh, so that we can have these trainings, so that we can make the station itself more visitor friendly. So when people do come in to conduct business, whether it's to get, obtain a permit, a fire permit, whether it's just come in, they want to see the equipment. This is the town owned equipment. The town <coughs> purchases this fire apparatus. It's their equipment. We operate it. We're responsible for it. And, and we're the custodians of that equipment. But really that the residents should see what they have. It's di difficult, if not actually dangerous in, in this station. Going back again to the apparatus floor, because we're so tight, and, and the, the newer equipment that we're getting, our newest engine, Engine 4, which is an incredible piece of apparatus, it's large. And not only large height-wise, they're long. And, and we actually shrunk that specific piece of apparatus down as much as we could to fit in this space, not only height-wise by the building, but length-wise, because we're limited. It was literally down to the inch. And when we were dealing with the apparatus architect, when they designed the apparatus, that it was, you know, they're kind of comparing us to a city fire department. That, you know, is, is opposed to more of an urban, uh, suburban fire department, mm. we're that limited by what we can fit because we keep an engine behind it. So what I'm getting at is when we try to have visitors here, and you know, in the past we've had the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, different youth groups coming in, it's actually kind of dangerous in the apparatus floor now because you're really squeezing, literally squeezing between apparatus to get from one side of the room to the other, and you've got maybe a foot in the front, but now you're between the garage door that's not something we really want anybody near. If that door goes up, or it, it's just sharp. You know, the apparatus tends, there's some sharp edges where they get old. Um, they're dirty sometimes. As much as we keep them clean, just you come right back from a, a road. Nobody's really designed, you know, nobody really should be expected to, to brush up against the vehicle to, to move past it. And that, we're doing that on a daily basis. We do that 24 hours a day in this station to get from one truck to another to another, depending on what you're assigned to. We're used to it. But when we have, you know, children in here, families, you know, even, even our firefighters' families come in to visit, we're watching because it, it's tight. It's dangerous. The building's just not that friendly for the public to come in. And I really, that bothers me. I, I really don't want to have a disconnect from this department or the community because we'd like to do more community-based community, community -based trainings. We'd love to do more CPR trainings. Uh, we used to do some in the past. Again, it will be in the same day room, the kitchen area. Derek's talking about the parking now is an issue, you know, and, and we've lost some, some parking because of the construction up front. And I don't see that getting better. I think that's actually going to continue to get worse. So that, that in itself, that disconnect from the community, that's a problem that I'd, I'd like to see addressed. I think so far during this uh, conversation, you guys, you both have done an exceptional job in highlighting some of the ma major problems with both facilities. Um, I think you've really made a case for it. I think the one thing that we should also make sure we mention is, is if you are able to gain approval for a new facility, where will you do it? And is there is there enough space in town? Is there enough land, a, a, a parcel of land that will big and be big enough to be able to place that facility on? Excellent point. And again, this is what I think the, the town appointed uh, fire station building committee is, is really going to be tasked with. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, we're limited by what, what we have left in available room in this town. We have really built um, a lot in this town. And, it, and because the location is critical, sure, we could put it 
there's a lot of still open areas in town. However, that's really not a, a central location for a fire station. We want to be able to respond uh, quickly anywhere in town from one location. We're extremely limited by what we have. There are a few locations in town we are looking at, and you know, th there's a few that we, we thought may work as well, and, and they're, they're somewhat being disproven based on whether it's wetlands, whether it's the response time, a number of reasons. We're still looking at that. Uh, I'm still open for suggestions, but we're, we're, we think we know that the very few sites available. Uh, North School, I think, is still a great location, but that's what the feasibility is going to either prove or disprove. You know, they may find something against that with response times that, that we haven't seen. You know, across from the high school, there's land directly across from the high school. However, that I, I believe, first of all, the ownership is by the state, and I, I think it's Housing Urban Development that owns that, adjacent to the uh, 100 Lincoln Boulevard, the, the Abington Senior Housing. But even if the town owned that, that's an extremely difficult place to place a fire station because at least twice a day, Glenevich Way across from the high school is just shut down when you know the students are coming and going, as well as if there's sporting events, if there's events at town hall, if there's events up at the field. Uh, that is an extremely congested area for us to try to safely respond to or from. An alternative to that would be to try to put a road behind there going out behind Lowe's to Thayer Street, which would be expensive. There's a lot of site work with that, if that's even possible. But even if that was done, that's a long road to respond through to ultimately get to Route 18. Uh, I, I think that's going to be a difficult location. We're looking at land on Brockton Ave, believe it or not, that the town owns. And it's up on the corner of Brockton Ave and High Street. And it meanders up. It angles up behind Walmart. Uh, there's 17 acres. However, a lot of that portion does not appear to be buildable because of the wetlands and, and whatnot. And I also think the response times with that, to respond from there to the extreme northern end of the town, especially if they begin developing cell field, I, I think that's going to be an issue. Uh, so the location the location's critical. We're, we're looking, but we're limited. Derek, I, I would ask you, getting ready to chair this committee, what are some of the some of the things that you're preparing to be able to hold these conversations and gather this information and intel to further um, this possible facility to being built one day? Well, I mean, I think it's all going to come down to the completion of the feasibility study and take the information that comes from that, uh, as well as the work and flow of how the fire department works, and put that together and just make sure that that information is shared with everybody that's on the committee. Um, hopefully, once the feasibility study is complete and it gives us some reference points, then we can really start to kind of come up with grander ideas, but well, ultimately we still have to wait till we find out where the best spot for the station would be if we were going to go forward with it. Gentlemen, anything we haven't mentioned during this segment, um, whether it's in regards to either of the two facilities, the feasibility study, um, looking for land, all the problems that you have with both of them, um, or even as far as getting information out to the people who are watching this right now. There's going to be a lot of information we want to get to the residents. I'm a resident. Derek's a resident. You know, we also live and work in the town. We pay the same taxes. We, we understand. We get it. However, we, we, the longer we wait on this, these problems are not going to go away, both within the safety features of both stations or the safety limitations, as we've discussed, as well as the locations. The longer we as a community wait cost. Uh, to put this out, the cost is going to increase. Uh, we have no cost estimates on anything yet. That, that portion of the feasibility study is not complete. Uh, we have not seen any grand plans yet. We're still in the fairly early stages of, of the, the feasibility study. But I think everybody fairly understands we, we have issues here. And you know, there's really a reason it, it, it's kind of gone on this long. We've maintained the buildings. We had other major projects in town that were taken care of. Um, it's kind of you know, I, I think in the priority list, I think the fire department now is, is probably at the top of that list now. You know, we, we built, you know, a number of other uh, large municipal projects and great projects in this town. High school, middle school, town hall library, the police, the sewer department, the senior um, center, um, some smaller ones as well. A lot of that was grant work or whatever. But we're one of the busiest, most um, well-used um, buildings left in this town, and we're, we're between the construction on Route 18, that absolutely really brought this to the forefront, as well as the size of the apparatus, that kind of shrunk down the, the floor space as well. And it, 
that's difficult to get around. The apparatus is just coming larger because the roles that a modern fire department, including Abington, does, we're responding to more uh, different types of emergencies that back in 1964 they wouldn't have even have imagined. You know, emergency medical is one, but beyond that, hazardous materials. We're looking at storing ballistic armor now in the apparatus. That was, I still have to get my head around that, but we're there. Uh, Today's world. The, the equipment that we have, you know, we, we have modern equipment both to keep the residents or, or patients' victims safe as well as our firefighters. Uh, so all of this means we, we need larger apparatus. The, um, so the longer we wait on this, I, I think it's only going to get more expensive. So that's why I am trying to, to kind of, not rush this, but move this forward as rapidly as we can. I'd like to be able to present something at the next town meeting and then let the residents decide. Uh, and, and then it is what it is. But because the longer we wait, I think our firefighters are more in danger from the carcinogens and just walking around here and, and other things. And the longer we wait, it's going to get more expensive So for the residents. So I'm trying to get this going fairly quickly, as well as once Route 18 is complete and we do have four lanes out here, that's coming. And even if for whatever reason the town decided we're going to get a new fire station now, that takes years to get. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, several years just to, to design and locate and build a fire station if we were to do that. So that's why, you know, time is of the essence. Before I go back to you for closing words, anything you want to say that we may have overlooked uh, discussing or we want to remind folks about this feasibility study you're serving on um, the board to kind of gather information and intel about building a new firehouse? The, um, uh, the purpose of the internal fire department uh, committee was just to gather the information of all the firefighters, get their opinions on how things are, how things should be, compare them to the way things uh, are done at more modern fire stations and bring that to the town committee and, and hopefully you know, shed some light and be able to answer questions. When you know, the committee is put together for the town, it's not all firefighters that are on that. There's just going to be a couple of us. And our purpose there would be really to explain how a fire department really works and what is needed and what, you know, what we would be looking for. There are citizens at large who are, who are going to be on that, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, any elected officials at all as well? The just citizens, right? Just, just citizens. Which is good. Yeah. We're going to have people. Um, Chief, I go to you before we close and wrap this up. Anything you want to say to the folks who are viewing this? And, and again, this is going to be one of, one of you know, a few videos that we're going to put together to better inform people, get people on board with what's going on, at least to be better informed, wh whether they, they want to vote for uh, an override or debt exclusion to fund this. That's, that's something that's down the road. Exactly. The idea is to give them the information, to be well informed so they can make a well informed vote. And Kevin, you're absolutely correct. And, and again, to the residents, our goal on this is simply to educate you. We're trying to be completely transparent. We're trying to show you what we're talking about. This isn't just because we want a new fire station. It's because we need a new fire station. That, that's the difference. And I think that's really why we've been here as long as we have. We, we've kind of held off on that because we realize that the town is only so large with, with funding sources. It's, it's not a want, it's a need. Um, th this, as Kevin said, is, should just be one of the first of hopefully several um, different forms and types of uh, public information we're trying to get to you. We're going to have a, a website established specifically for the, the fire station feasibility study. We don't have that yet, but that is coming. Um, social media, the fire department has a, a Facebook account. We'll, we'll try to include things on that. Certainly through Abington Cam, we're, we're trying to do uh, an outreach that way. We're trying to hit everybody. Uh, with, with the different types of media that they may use. Certainly any resident is always welcome to come in and, and tour the stations. We'll show you firsthand. We'll give you the tour. We'll show you what we're talking about. We want you to be informed so that, you know, if or when uh, any type of a, an article is presented uh, to the voters, you know what we're talking about. And, and at that point, it's, you know, whatever the voters want to, want to vote, we respect that. We just want to make sure that you're well informed. Firefighter Hamadi, thank you. Thank you. Chief Nuttall, thank Kevin, you. thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank and you. thank you very much for tuning into this special program, and stay tuned for more.